Hey guys, I'm here today to do my December wrap up. So this is a little bit delayed, but that's fine. So I DNF'd three books in December and I thought I would briefly talk about them here. So firstly, we have 12 Nights by Andrew Searcher. Now I bought this one in Waterstones. I just read what it was about, thought it sounded amazing and bought it. And then when I got home and added it to my Goodreads shelf, I realized it had a really low rating of 3.12. That's really, really low, particularly for a children's book. And so I was a bit like, mm odd but I decided to you know pick it up anyway because I have it and people disagree and initially I got about 50 pages in and I was like what are people talking about this is beautiful so this is a children's story um, about uh, two young sisters and their father works at, I think at Cambridge University could be Oxford I think it's actually maybe Oxford not sure and he goes missing one night and when they go to collect him with their mum and um, everyone says we haven't heard of him no idea who you're talking about and then weird things start to happen and when they go to bed that night these creatures appear um, who were coming to take the last effects of their father and the girls go with them and they find out about this magical world it's very literary for a children's book um, it's been compared a lot to um, Philip Pullman or C.S. Lewis and I can see those parallels um, but I got about a hundred pages in and I started to see what people were saying about this book in um, negative ways in that I think the book gets really caught up in the beauty of the writing um, in this magical world um, but it darts from scene to scene without you really um, having you know watching the flow between that scene you just suddenly realize you're somewhere else and um, all these cool things are popped in um, but you feel really disconnected from the characters and it just all feels a bit jumbled and um, it feels like someone who's had an amazing idea of a magical world and a magic system and can write beautifully but don't really understand how to, how to construct a story or how to relay the um i guess like the physics or the mechanics of this magical world because some of it just doesn't really make sense so sadly i dnf this one but um i was at the point in december where i just didn't want to continue reading books that weren't bringing me like a lot of joy so i'm fine with that so there's that one Another children's book that I recently hauled and decided to DNF is Winter Magic. Um, this is a short story collection all about winter, lots of Christmas themes in here, and these are by all different um, children's book authors. So, in hindsight, which is a wonderful thing, I probably shouldn't have picked this up because I don't like fast-paced books or narratives. And short stories for children, I feel like, are always going to be that because children, in general, aren't going to enjoy, you know, slow character studies, um, short stories that just like focus on one theme or have lots of descriptions. They want a story, and so to force a children's story in like 30 pages, it's just a bit manic for me. Um, I read like two or three, and I just wasn't enjoying it. And at that point, I was like, these are all selected by the same author. Um, her taste is obviously just different to mine, and I just feel like I was the wrong audience. So decided to DNF that one. The next one I was a little bit sad about because this is Portable Childhoods by Ellen Clage and I had this in my five star TBR predictions. Um, so this is a short story collection that I have had for a few years and always been convinced that I really really love. Um, this is fabulous fiction and I read about a third of this, about 70 pages and I did consider carrying on because it was so quick I could have like finished it in like an hour, hour and a half and then I thought what's the point? I'd be carrying on just to finish it and just to be able to mark another book on Goodreads but I wouldn't enjoy it um, so what I did was I kept flicking forward and starting um, some of the other stories in the collection um, particularly the ones that everyone on Goodreads said were the best ones and I was still like I just don't care this has got really high ratings on Goodreads and I think this is literally just the taste thing. I think loads of people could love this. I think for whatever reason her writing style or her themes just doesn't like work with me. Um, like some emotional moments just wouldn't like wouldn't pull at my heartstrings. There were just things I just didn't care about. So yeah, sadly I DNF'd that one as well. Now onto the books I actually finished. So we have two graphic novels. This is Cree by Una. And I quite enjoyed this one. This is um, a bit of an odd graphic novel, really. So we follow, uh, I think she's an unnamed protagonist, I'm unsure. We just follow this lady who's going on a day out to go to a local women's community shelter called Cree. And she just spends the day there doing crafty things. And as she's there, you see different women come into this community centre and their reasons for being there. So some of them are seeking legal advice. Um, some of them are there just to, to talk to others. Some of them are there because of domestic violence. 
and you just watch her there really and then she leaves and gets on the bus and they all say see you next week and you, you get the feeling this is a really lovely community um so the bit that actually touched me the most in this is the afterward because the author explains how important community centers like this are particularly for women and um, she talks about the idea behind the novel the graphic novel and, and what this is celebrating um and that made me feel um, really emotional and affected and um, you know I started trying to look into what sort of things I could do in my local area so I need to um, sort of look into that a bit more but the graphic novel itself I didn't find you know amazing but what it's talking about I think is important so uh, a bit of an odd one like I think I'd have maybe found like a leaflet on this like just as like useful I don't know so yeah there's that one. And then the next one is Woman in Battle by Marta Breen and Jenny Jordal. So I have the um, advanced reader's copy of this and so I'm unsure if this has changed once it got to publication. I doubt it but it could have done. And my reason for saying that is this is a collection um, of sort of short pieces on um, women who have changed um, women's rights throughout the world um, and throughout time. And so um, we start at a certain point in history and we move, you know, up until the present day and we move between different um, historical female figures as we do that. And I guess, so so in some ways I found this great. I found some of it really um, empowering and informative and it made me want to look into some of these women more and really realise there was just some people I hadn't heard of, which was a concern. Um, I thought the artwork was really great. Um, that's not a nice page, I'm not going to show you that. Um, I thought the artwork was really great, so um, I really enjoyed that, I really enjoyed the use of colours, but I felt that um, sometimes you'd get a woman and her name would be like at the start of her segment with her date of birth, um, and if she's passed away, her date of passing away, um, and it would appear almost like a new chapter. Sometimes that wouldn't happen, you just carry on um, and suddenly have someone else in there and realise you were focusing on them, but they wouldn't be properly introduced. Sometimes a, a new segment would be started, like you'd be told we're now focusing on the civil rights movement. Um, sometimes the chapter headings would be different for that and it just, it didn't feel cohesive. It felt like somebody had decided let's format it like this and then they forgot the way they wanted to format it. And I feel like th those things were a bit jarring and just pulled me out. So yeah, it, it seems like an odd thing to have an issue with, but I think it's actually quite important in a graphic novel. So the content's great, the artwork's great, um, this is just a taster, I'm, you know, I'm assuming that each of these women probably has loads of non-fiction books written about them, so it is literally tip of the iceberg stuff, but I just had an issue with the way it was structured. So I enjoyed this, but didn't love it. Then the rest of the books I read, I feel like December could have been like my best, one of my best reading months in the year because I read loads of books that were very nearly five stars. Um, the, the whole time I was reading them I was like, is this going to be a five star? Is this going to be my favourite books of the year list? And ultimately only one is, which I'll talk about at the end, but I am quite a harsh um, critic and I really thought all these were amazing so I'd really recommend them. So firstly we have In the Days of Rain by Rebecca Stott. So this is a memoir and I actually listened to this one on audiobook which I really really enjoyed. Um, I recently got myself a script account um, which I, I didn't even know was available to people in the UK. I thought Scribd was just for um, US listeners, so hence why I'd never got it. But I got a Scribd account and was like incredibly excited about all the amazing non-fiction on there um, and found that this was on there, so this is the first book I've listened to on Scribd. I do have um, one of those, I don't even know what they're called, like a Scribd code. Um, I'll write it across here and like link it down below um, and you, I think you get like a free first month um, which is what I used, I think I used Jean's code um, and if you do that you get a free first month and I think I get like a few dollars for it so that's a nice tip, thanks. But um, yeah it's really, it is really good actually like in all honesty I still have my Audible account but I'm feeling like I'm getting loads more out of script because I have about 30 books, um, fiction and non-fiction saved to listen to and a lot of it is US books that I just wouldn't find on Audible, UK Audible just wouldn't have them so that I think they both give different things and I'm really happy to now have script as well. So I listened to this on there and it's really great. Now one thing that added to this for me is that Rebecca Stott is actually an academic at the University of East Anglia where I work 
and so she was talking about um, the, the local area I knew, she mentioned the moment she comes for the job interview at UEA and so you know some of it was heightened by the fact that it all felt quite recognisable to me. But disregarding that, this is just an amazing memoir. So this is about the fact that, let me just double check this. So she was raised in a fundamentalist Christian sect called the Exclusive Brethren and her parents actually decided to leave that Christian sect. I think when she was like in young adulthood, like early adulthood, and it, she is with her father at the start of the memoir, at the point of his death. He knows he's going to die and he's desperately trying to get all this down on paper. He, he's wanted to write a memoir for years, um, but whenever he comes to a certain period in his life, he can't write it because he's so um, appalled by what happened and the things he did and the things he um, sort of um, knew were happening and didn't stop. So we never managed to finish it. So in the last weeks of his life, Rebecca sits and talks to her father about it and she records him on a voice recorder. Um, and this is the memoir that came from that. Um, so this goes all the way back to like the 60s and follows their, the family's experience in the Exclusive Brethren. And then it sort of follows on um, as Rebecca Stott's family leave the Exclusive Brethren and how, um, you know, sort of terrifying that was for her you know she said people throughout her life have said oh you must have felt so um free and happy and she said actually you know I felt really terrified like to be told continuously if you do that you'll go to hell and then to be told no it's fine just do it um it's actually quite quite terrifying and traumatic and then a lot of it is about her relationship with her father and how complicated that was now I um all those things can make a great memoir but what you know really heightens it is how well it's written and this is written beautifully um there's a scene at the start you know following her father's death um, and he's living in this old um what would have been i think a, a mill um in this flat area of suffolk fen and there's an owl sweeping round outside in the moments of his death and the way she describes it is exquisite so um, i'd really recommend this and i as i said i um, really enjoyed the audio book because the author narrates it so there's that one and then we have this next one, and um, this is The Wildlands by Abby Jenai. So this is the book that won my um, December reading vlog vote on Patreon. So every month now I choose three books and I let um, my tier three patrons vote for which book they'd like me to read and then I do a vlog as I'm reading the book and upload it. And I really enjoy doing that because I guess it forces me to um, think more about what I'm reading and what I'm liking and not liking about it. So um, I really enjoyed this one and I read this in a few days right at the end of the month. So this is a novel about a young girl who uh, her brother went missing a few years before. Um, when she was about six years old there was a hurricane and her father didn't survive the hurricane and her sister who was then about 20 um, became the um, the sort of legal guardian of all of her siblings um, and a few months after her brother who is about 17 um, ran off and sort of deserted them and we then are in three years in the future when she's about nine and her brother turns up and says you know do you want to go away with me and you find out very early on in the novel that he's um, a sort of animal activist but to quite an extreme level and he's recently um, set off a bomb in a lab that tests on animals and he is you know, being sought, like people know it's him and he's a criminal on the run and he takes her with him. And the novel flashes between Cora's perspective, who's the nine-year-old, and then her older sister Darlene's perspective as she, you know, reports this to the police and um, the police are, you know, searching for them both. And this is really the journey of Cora and her brother as he you sort of realise the way he sees the world and um, the way he's portrayed is very much as someone who's a bit mentally unstable and also almost um, the way he talks to Cora comes across as you would expect like the leader of a cult to talk to somebody. You feel like he's selected Cora because she's so young and malleable and um, he just believes in really um, bizarre things. Now this was interesting for me because um, I trained in wildlife conservation, I'm a vegan, I, I believe in um, most of his reasoning behind um, this animal activism 
but yet I felt that he was really confused, also really um, hypocritical, and also the things he did, the steps he took, um, weren't helpful to anyone. And actually, you know, you hear these stories um, in any community, um, when some activists go um, a certain direction, they sort of misrepresent everyone else. And I think he was a perfect example of that. Um, and you realise that, you know, early on in the novel, that he's obviously not um, someone who's doing um, any of this the right way but Cora obviously as a child doesn't and so you, you follow that um, so I really enjoyed this I will say I didn't enjoy this as much as her previous novel The Light Keepers or her short story collection I think both of those were stronger for me and I think some of that is because this is set in um, some of the hotter states in America so um, some of this is in Oklahoma some is in Texas and some is in California whereas and the light keepers is set on a remote island which is really sort of cold and quite um, remote and gothic feeling um, and those are just the vibes I love um, so yeah I really enjoyed this it was uh, you know at some points tipping into a five star read for me but just didn't quite make it but I'd certainly recommend this one if you want to re read um, a book that has lots of um, environmental commentary this is a great one. And this next one I buddy read with Charlotte from Tired Mama Tries to Read and I know she put it in her favourite books of the year video because she absolutely loved it and I really enjoyed it too and that's Tears It and the Prince of Crows by Deborah K Davies. So I decided to pick this one up because I previously read Reason She Goes to the Woods which is her previous novel and really enjoyed it um, and when I had a look into what this was about they said it was set in the 1970s in a small Welsh town um, and it follows a 17 year old girl as she lives with her quite strict religious family and sort of starts to try and rebel from that so I was like 1970s young girl small village I love all those things and paired with Deborah K Davies writing it's exquisite so the way she writes is truly beautiful now, I can see why some people would just not like her writing style at all because if you're someone who says, I like minimalist writing, I like stripped back, I don't like words that aren't necessary, this is not for you. Deborah K Davies is as lyrical and descriptive as you can get. Um, sometimes we get two whole pages where she's just talking about what the, um, the plants and a garden look like or um, a cemetery um, or moss or trees and it's beautiful. It, it's so poetic, it borders on magic. Um, she's describing a scene which you would walk past and think was beautiful in the countryside, but you wouldn't think it was, um, you know, magical or um, it feels really um, filled with fairy tale and myth. Like the language is so rich, um, it feels like almost dark with it. Um, so it's, yeah, it's beautifully written. Um, it's a really slow moving novel, um, most of the novel you realise quite early on that Tirza actually isn't all that into all the religion right from the start um, and so it's it's not one of those novels like she's really devoutly religious and then oh my god it takes ages to realise she isn't and you know we watch that, actually right from the start she's a bit like oh you know this is all a bit much like really um, and we just follow sort of her growing up she makes quite a lot of poor decisions she isn't a really lovable character sometimes you just want to shake her and be like why are you doing this but I really liked watching her story when Charlotte and I were chatting about it we were both saying it's really nostalgic and cozy and comforting um, and some of that is because there's an awful lot of descriptions of food um, so there's so many descriptions of Tears are going into the kitchen and her mum making the dinner um, which is always on the table as soon as her father gets home and she, they'll describe the rather traditional food that she's making or the cakes that she's baking or Tirza and her cousin will be going for a picnic and they'll go and collect um, cupcakes and um, homemade lemonade from their mums to go take to the picnic um, it, yeah it's, it's very nostalgic um, and you can smell and um, taste all these things that are being described so I thought this was beautifully written and the only reason I, I didn't think this book was perfect in a five star read was because I don't really want to give much of the plot away but um, there's a couple of things that happen that are moving the plot along um, and I just felt a little bit like I guess Tears' reasoning wasn't really there and I think that was sort of the point but um, I, I guess I'd have liked a little bit more reasoning for that and I feel like perhaps it could have just been a little bit shorter and would have been stronger for that so yeah but I really enjoyed this book and if you do like um, really detailed um, lyrical descriptions then I'd highly recommend this one and then this last one um, you can see Luna liked too because she had a little buy of it it's not the last one actually I have an audiobook to talk about as well 
Um, this is Tender by Belinda McKeon and I was recommended this book by you guys after I loved um, both Sally Rooney's novels. So everyone was like, if you want to read another author like Sally Rooney then this is the author to go for and I completely agree. Now this is set in the 90s in Dublin and we follow two characters called James and Catherine. Um, so at the start of the novel they've known each other for like two weeks and they've just fallen head over heels for each other in a friendship way. Um, and they become so closely entangled in people's lives. And this really reminds you of, so if you've been to university, you go to this new place, you don't know anyone, um, so I went to university quite a few hours from home, and you sort of have to sink or swim in that you have to um, be brave enough to make friends really quickly because everybody else around you is. Um, and you meet these people, and if you're lucky enough, within sort of a few weeks, you realise these people feel like closest people to you ever. They're like your best friends, you're already having to decide who you're going to live with next year, you're already signing rent agreements with them all, um, and you're spending sort of, you know, 18 hours out of a day with them. You, the only time you're not with them is when you're sleeping, like it's insane. Um, it's very claustrophobic, and so you get that sense with their friendship, um, but what is different about them is they become very insular. So um, for me, and for a lot of people I know, that happened in a, a group of people, you know, five or six of you feel about that one another, but they feel that they're just about the two of them. And this novel really follows um, the shift in their relationship, I guess the power dynamics and the dynamics of um, who needs or loves one another more. So early on in the novel you already start to feel that from her perspective he's becoming somewhat of a burden and then um, you follow it from there. Um, this is excellent. The, so th the reason I think it is very like Sally Rooney's work is that it shares similar themes, um, you know, um, set in Ireland, um, similar, you know, um, sort of university life and really close-knit relationships. Um, the way she writes about um, dialogue um, and the way people think about love and friendship and obsession in their head is very similar to the way Sally Rooney, um, you know, writes her character's thoughts. However, if you struggle with Sally Rooney and that you think her writing style is a bit too experimental, um, not structured enough, um, a bit too pretentious, then I think Belinda McKeon, at least this novel, is like Sally Rooney, but a bit more um, normal, like it's a bit more narrative driven um, and just feels like a more um, acceptable, you know, no novel format. Um, so I really enjoyed this. And I was, for the first sort of 200 pages, I was obsessed. Like, I couldn't put it down. I, I was just, you know, racing through the pages um, and really loving it. The reason I didn't give this five stars is because, again, I felt like it was perhaps a bit too long. And I felt like there was a point in the novel where it could have just been edited down a little bit. And I also wasn't a fan of one of the techniques used right at the end. I'm not going to say what that is because I think it sort of spoils a little bit. Um, but if you've read it, you'll know what that is. And I just felt it was unnecessary. So, so that was, you know, a tiny bit of an annoyance for me. Um, but I really recommend this novel, particularly if you enjoyed um, Sally Rooney's work. So there's that one. And then lastly, and I'm not going to talk about this one a ton here because I'm hoping to carry on with the series and perhaps talk a bit more about it later, is Daughter of the Forest by Juliette Marillia. This was one of my favourite books of the year. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, so I listened to this one on audiobook, which I'd really recommend. Um, the narrator is excellent, and hearing all these voices and names in the Irish accent just added so much. So I picked up this book because I heard Jean rave about Juliet Marillia this year. So I've known about Juliet Marillia for quite a few years and I've always been on the fence. Part of me has been like, I think I could really enjoy them. And another part's been like, maybe they're a bit too like romance heavy. Um, and also part of me thought they might be like that sort of dry historical fiction fantasy. Like there's, there's some, that sounds a really bad way to describe it, but, th but there's some historical fantasy that I find is quite dry um, and just doesn't pull me through. This is not that, this is anything but dry and there is a romance but I adored it. It's absolutely wonderful. So if you don't know, um, Daughter of the Forest is the first book in a six book series um, and this one at least is um, focused on a fairy tale that we, you know, I think a lot of people would know. Um, the fairy tale of the sister whose brothers have changed into swans and she has to um, sew them, you know, jackets to transform them back. It's that fairy tale, but it's so much more than that fairy tale. Um, this book isn't 
surprising in in where it goes um, and I don't think from this novel I wouldn't say that's what Juliet Marillia does although perhaps she does in other novels um, but it's so filled with emotions um, beautifully written again lots of descriptions of um, the natural world and um, there's moments when so this is this is a difficult thing because I mentioned this in um, uh, one of my videos on Patreon one of my currently reading videos in that in the audiobook of Daughter of the Forest, the narrator pronounces the protagonist's name as Sirica. But whenever I saw other people talk about this novel, they always pronounced it Sorka or Sorsha. So then I looked on loads, like I looked at so many pronunciation videos and everybody was arguing in the comments, like no one agreed. Everyone was like, that's my name and this is how I pronounce it. It's my name and this is how I pronounce it. And people were saying like one of them is an anglicised version of it, one of them is an Americanised version of it, and Sirica was the original, blah 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 blah. So I was like, okay, okay, like, it's Sirica, this is what the audiobook is telling me. But then <laughs> I started the second audiobook in the series, um, and Sirica's name is mentioned by this uh, different narrator, and the audiobook narrator is also different, and they don't say it's Sirica, they say it's Sorka. So it's a bit confusing, but you know, for the purpose of this, I now think of her as Sirica because I heard a 25 hour audiobook where she was referenced as. Serica. Anyway, so she's a fascinating character and there's moments when she goes off into the, the forests and it is beautiful. Um, there's some difficult things in this novel, um, there's scenes of sexual assault um, which aren't easy to read or listen to um, but I think they're really well handled. Um, one thing that I'd heard people say about this novel is that they felt some of it was gratuitous um, and it was used as a plot device and I didn't feel like that at all, I genuinely felt like it was really well handled, uh, it didn't feel like a plot device because it was really important to Sarah as a character um, and it wasn't something that happened and then you know we move on, it was something that happened and you know was was really um, integral to the rest of the um, the novel and I just loved it so as I said I was audio booking this and I basically would come home and just lie on the sofa with my audio booking like for hours I read this book in about three or four days which is insane isn't it seeing as I was um I was at work in those days but I loved it I couldn't stop listening and it was just wonderful so yeah one of my favorite books of the year so I'm going to carry on with the series and carry on with Juliet and Marilio because I think she's amazing so yeah, those are all the books I read in December. Let me know if you've read any of those and if you have what you thought of them. And also let me know what was your favourite book in December and also if you are going to pick any of these up, I'd be intrigued to know. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!